Our coverage of the Winter Nationals here in Pomona continues now with the Pro Stock Competition coming up next. The official announcing voice for the NHRA, Steve Evans, will bring you up to date with all the expertise. Steve, the Pro Stock Competition offers some mighty good matchups here, but I'm wondering, first of all, is this the type of machinery you might find on the street with some modifications? Yes, it is, Tom. In reality, these are the hottest of Detroit's high-performance muscle cars, as they're advertised. Dodges, Plymouths, Chevrolets, virtually every make and model represented. However, they're very, very expensive machines to prepare for drag racing. When these, pros, when these pros get through with them, there's really not too much left that originated in Detroit. The rules are very strict, but they do allow some modifications. We'll see 16 of the best, and they'll eliminate themselves down to eight. And we've got Bagshaw and Landy coming out first, Steve. Yes, we do. Dick Landy, a professional driver for the Dodge Division of Chrysler Corporation. He lives in Northridge, California. All of these pro stockers are equipped with four-speed transmissions, and they're really one of the most difficult cars in drag racing to drive. As we'll see, the driver very busy inside that cockpit. Here's Bill Bagshaw. Bagshaw, also a professional drag racer from North Hollywood, California. Calls himself the Red Light Bandit. Both drivers are away with green starts. A beautiful duel as they hammer the four speeds through the quarter mile. Dick Landy by no more than half a car length skills remained as sharp as they had been in his super stock days and in three years he netted seven NHRA national event titles five in 1971 for Dino Don Nicholson success also followed in pro stock as a leading Ford campaigner, Nicholson's performances on track were highlighted by sharp driving and record runs. Most unlimited opportunities to create, to experiment, to overwhelm. I think uh, a lot. He, he really changed the sport, as you know. He, he's just done a tremendous job with that, that rear engine dragster that just changed everything around and made the sport a lot safer. The rear engine dragster had been tried before, but no one approached the project quite like Don did. 71, 71 Pomona won the event. And it was the first rear engine car to ever qualify at a national event, much less win one. So it's my proudest achievement in this sport. Well, technically speaking, Don Perdoma, it should have worked long before. I mean, the car doesn't know where the engine is. Well, the car really does know where the engine is, and Garlitz was the only one that to work that out, get the steering right and the rear end ratio right and the balance of the machine and have enough nerve to drive it. So the handwriting was on the wall for the demise of the front motor dragster as Carl Olsen loses to Don Garlitz. The Mona Raceway. Hope oh, it's pro stock, Tom. And here is a rematch from last year. Socks and Martins, Plymouth Barracuda from Burlington, North Carolina. And hey, Rob, can you bring that audio up for us? The Chevrolet fans' favorite of Berwyn, Pennsylvania. These two men faced each other for the title last year. And January won it. That was the last... Yeah, unfortunately, we're not getting any Sox audio on these at the moment. Didn't win. They've won everything since. Grumpy Jenkins is known because of uh, his real dedication more than anything else. You can't really talk to Bill in the pit area. He's very intent on what he's As doing. this clip's not giving us audio at the moment, we can talk to you as it's going, but you can clearly see Ronnie Sox on the far side of the racetrack. Okay, and here we see the tree in the right-hand portion of the Great, okay. You can see the pro start and the two cars leave. A beautiful start. Jenkins may have been out first, but Sox might have let him get away, knowing he can drive around him and he can. Ronnie Sox. 9.89 the elapsed time for Sox. It's going to take a mechanical failure to beat him. Okay, here is a replay of it. Another pro stock race. The action fast and furious, and from this vantage point, it's very difficult to get a hold of them sometime. In the left-hand lane, Akron Arlen Vanke from Akron, Ohio. Here in the tower lane, a Plymouth Barracuda to challenge him. Banky is due for a major NHRA event win. He's been runner-up at two championships in 1970. He's got a race on his hands here. But he pulls it out. Arlen Vanke moving into the semifinals. Dick Landy in the tower lane. In the far lane is Wally Booth in a Chevrolet. Booth from Ohio, Landy from Northridge, California. And the Chevrolet fans are on their feet. 
the Chrysler Corporation products have been ruling pro stock, but look at this, and they'll cheer for this one. Wally Booth, the crowd goes nuts. Wally Booth, the most successful Chevrolet here at the Winter Nationals thus far. 992, and here it is again. Wally Booth and Dick Landy, both in the far lane, and he's pulling away inch by inch. A full car length lead, and across the finish line. Wally Booth moving into the semifinals. We'll be back with more action from the 1971 Winter Nationals in just a moment. This race will feature our defending champion car, the Hawaiian of Roland Leon from Honolulu, Hawaii, and the machine just now having its body latched down, Big John Masmanian of Whittier, California, and his driver, Rich Sarunian, who is also his nephew. The Hawaiian being driven this year by young Wood Boss, Boss of Westminster, California, you can bet just as soon as the snows melt in the east, this team will be headed out on their annual tour of during a drag strips all over the United States. That's how they make their living. Steve I can't compete with that burnout, Steve. You know, the burnouts really have added an awful lot to the show, not only uh, as well as helping the elapsed time. Generally, at most drag strips around the country, the funny cars will go up to the starting line and do burnouts from the starting line, sometimes almost the full quarter mile and back all the way back up again. Obviously, there's not time for that in a big meet here like the Winter Nationals. I was about to comment that at first glance, a funny car just looks like a strange automobile. And then you see the driver sitting right dead in the middle of it, just as if it were any other type of racing machine, and you realize that it's something more than just what you'd see on the city street. That's true, and even though there's nothing on these automobiles that's stock, not even the body, they're made out of very, very lightweight fiberglass, they're just because there's a strong product identity factor. The Chevy is good for the Chevy funny cars, and the Ford for the Ford and so forth. Masmanian, utilizing a Plymouth Barracuda appearing a replica of a Plymouth Barracuda. Driver Richard Cerrone, strapped in, he's completed his burnouts, and he'll meet the Dodge of Roland Leon, appropriately named the Hawaiian. Inside the cockpit, you can see Butch Moss. Moss moving up very slowly. These machines utilize a two-speed transmission. They have onboard fire extinguishers and every conceivable safety device. The nitromethane fumes are very strong, hence the mass. An unbelievable wheel stand by Richard Saronian. Moss blazes the tires to victory. You'll seldom see a funny car stand on the bumper like that, Tom. Take another look at it, Steve. Just that is really something. Incredible wheel stand, especially considering uh, that the drivers uh, think there's a lack of traction. Now you'll see the front wheels start to go skyward. Sarunian not lifting at all. Rocks over and it may bounce all the way up. There it goes. Almost all four wheels off the ground. It could have done some severe damage to that $20,000 car. Gene Snow for bringing the class to the attention of NHRA and legitimizing it finally. And it was only appropriate that in 1970, Gene Snow was the NHRA Funny Car World Champion. Snow at one time ran as many as three cars on the match race circuit, giving a lot of young drivers a chance at stardom. by side, behind the driver, in front of the driver. We've seen Indianapolis-style engines, turbines, uh, just an incredible poker. Also, here's the camera on the starting line, atop the NHRA control tower where the announcing the timing and scoring is done. And this is Kenny Safford. Safford, in the semifinal round, will be meeting Jimmy King. King and Marshall from Providence, Rhode Island. I don't think that Safford ever felt he'd be in the semifinals. He took this ride from Larry Bowers at the very last moment. He's a funny car driver by occupation. He just didn't happen to have a ride right now. And there again we see the Bowers crew adding more fuel to Safford's tank. Now there may be some accusations later that that's some kind of secret sauce. But I believe it's this fuel just topping off the tank. That may also indicate that they're burning a very high percentage of nitromethane, because the higher percentage, the more volume you burn. Would you believe four gallons in one run? And it costs about 7.50 a gallon. Zooming in on the action, and here's a man who took no chances. 
He'd never been to a drag race. He wasn't sure what it was all about. That's our cameraman who just wants to make sure he hears mother when she calls him for supper tonight, that's all. Kenny Safford anxiously awaiting the bro start. King and Marshall in the far lane. A good start. A beautiful race. King and Marshall, Kenny Safford, who won it? Kenny Safford, the wind light flashing for Ken Safford. And here's the one the fans have been waiting for. Big Jim Dunn, a fireman from La Mirada, California. Goes about 240 pounds. Jammed into the cockpit there. of a double A fuel dragster. Dunn, the farthest he's ever gone in national competition was to runner up here at the Winter Nationals some years ago where he was defeated by the Hawaiian. The crew making a lot of hand signals to Dunn, trying to get him in the puddles of bleach. Garlitz! Garlitz already headed towards the starting line. Garlitz wearing a, <laughs> not only does Garlitz have a rear engine car, he's wearing a full coverage helmet. The breather mask is hidden, and he peers through a window in the helmet. We've seen a lot of bike racers and Indianapolis racers use these helmets, but this is the first time we've seen one on a drag racer. Garlitz has had the best time in the top fuel, 6.7, and uh, I think, Steve, you indicated he looked as though he really hasn't had to push it yet. These drivers are about the same age, in their middle 30s, and Dunn is going to have to get off the starting line first, based on their previous elapsed times. But getting out ahead of Garlitz is next to impossible. Oh, he really comes off that line, doesn't he? Incredible Don Garlitz. Dunn's motor lays down on him and he gives up. It was fruitless. 6.70, the elapsed time for Don Garlitz. Well, he's consistent of nothing else. 672, 672, 68 in the original elimination, now 67. But only 209 miles an hour. He's going into the finals with a potential for a great deal more horsepower. Indeed. Kenny Safford has really got his work cut out for him. No question about it. It'd be quite a race to decide the top fuel eliminator. Coming up in 1971, Winter Nationals champion in stock. The station wagon is Dave Bortman of Michigan. In the left-hand lane is Californian Marv Ripes of Van Nuys. Ripes was the only Californian left after the first round of competition. The handicap being very, very carefully calculated. Dialed in for the electronic Christmas tree. Marv Ripes, this will be his second, if he wins it, his second major event victory in a row. He won the Super National in Ontario in November. Both drivers leave green lights. Marv Ripes in the Corvette, trying to get around him, trying, trying very hard, but I don't think he can do it. Bortman in the tower lane is your 1971 Winter Nationals stock eliminator champion. 12.91 seconds elapsed time. It appeared for a moment as if Ripes was going to catch him right here in the replay, and then it looks like the car might have faltered a little bit. The engine might have stumbled because he made up no further ground, and there's the win. The Rod Shop Dodge from Columbus, Ohio, Dave Bortman from Muskegon, Michigan. His time was 12.9 and his speed 105 miles an hour to win the stock eliminator title. We were talking earlier how very few men have ever won two Winter Nationals. They've never done it in Top Fuel, or Funny Car, or in Pro Stock. Well, here, burning out in his Super Stock H Mustang is Barry Poole of Chatham, Ontario, Canada. He is the defending champion in Super Stock Eliminator. He could make it two in a row. They'll really abuse their equipment for these final runs and it's well worth it. The stock eliminator champion here with contingency money can make as much as $7,000. And Jim Clark hopes to go home and break that happy word to his family. Jim Clark's Hemi Express Dodge of Baldwin Park, California. So it's a Canadian versus a Californian. You see the tires wrinkling up. They have only as much air pressure as they possibly need. The tires wanting to spin right off of the rims. In fact, there's screws through the steel rims to hold the tires on the wheels. The final in Super Stock Eliminator. Handicap advantage to the Canadian in the Mustang. Jim Clark, still smoke coming from beneath the car, but it doesn't seem to hurt his performance. Clark. 
We couldn't call it. Let's see it. He did not drive around him. The Canadian, Barry Poole, is your winner in a Ford Mustang. We'll take a look at this one again also. Boy, this is some close competition, Tom. That was a race, as this replay will show, right here as they come to the finish. Boy. If there had been another 10 feet and a quarter of a mile, I think your Winter Nationals champion would be Jim Clark. But it's not. It's Barry Poole. His speed was 121.62 miles an hour. His elapsed time, 11.28. There are only 12 machines remaining in this 1971 Winter National. These are all final runs. The first car out for the final in modified eliminator is the California Flash, as he's known, Butch Lill of Tulare, California. He is driving for Don Grothier of Oklahoma City. The competition will be a man well familiar with the winner's circle, Carol Cottle, Amarillo, Texas. Cottle's 55 Chevrolet will have about a day and a half head start, Tom. This Grothier <laughs> is the much quicker car. Here is Butch Leo, one of the most talented pro stock drivers. He's preparing a new car for his own use. Didn't have it ready in time for the Winter Nationals and fortunately picked up this ride with Don Grothier. Here we see the tree come down. Quite a handicap, about two seconds, and that's a long, long time. Butch Leal moving after Carol Cottle, the Texan holding on. You know he's looking in the rearview mirror. Here comes Butch, the Texan, Carol Cottle, the winner of Modified Eliminator. Butch kept signaling for a left turn as he was going down the straightaway. And again, we'll replay it. I don't think I've seen closer races consistently in final runs at any event. And look at this, Butch Leal going about 30 miles an hour faster, but it's not enough. We've seen it several times today. We've seen it clock the quickest elapsed time ever for a car of this type, Don Enriquez. And Enriquez also won the Super Nationals in November. Our Super Nationals winners, even though they're getting into the finals here at Pomona, are having a hard time making it two in a row. Gene Adams with the baseball cap on, wiping down that tire. And he says, flog it out, Don. And here's Steve Woods, the competition from Fremont, California. The national record holder in the double B gas supercharged class, Steve and Rhonda Woods. Supercharged Chrysler, a four-door prefect body. And this will be a long, long handicap. Steve Woods will be almost at the eighth of a mile before Enriquez is allowed to leave. They were showing the handicap to the two drivers there, and apparently, Steve, they both agree that's what it should be. The pre-staging lights are lit. Enriquez is staged, Woods is staged. Starter Buster Couch triggers the Christmas tree. A green light for Steve Woods, a green light for Don Enriquez. And watch this fuel-burning Chrysler move in the mid-range. Look at that! Boy, did he come. Whoa. Don Enriquez. 7.34 seconds. Steve Woods just about got his doors blown off when Don Enriquez came around him. Incredible performance, Adams and Enriquez. 199.11 miles per hour. And in that last eighth of a mile, Enriquez really turned it on. He's that the eight eliminators will win. The figure you see with a helmet under his arm and the wide drag racing slick balanced beside him. An outstanding trophy. I think uh, a little more unique and a little more meaningful than just the average cup. And the other trophies, that's typical of class winner awards and special awards. And here's our top gas final moving down. One of these trophies will belong to one of these gentlemen. Will it be Walt Stevens here driving the odd couple from Van Nuys, California? The Chevrolet engine is forward. The Chrysler is aft. We don't see any competition coming down for Walt Stevens. Where is Bill Mullins? Evidently, Mullins not able to make the call. That's a bitter blow. Oh, the twin engine car from Birmingham, Alabama. Qualify for the finals and unable to get there. This is one of the few times that we've had a single run for the finale in an eliminator. Walt Stevens, you know he's just grinning from ear to ear behind that aluminum mask. 
He's also about six pounds down the grip. And there he is with a V signal up in the air at 190 miles an hour. Walt Stevens, your 1971 top gas champ. We'll get his time and speed. Stevens was taking it easy. He had his hand up in the air. He had won the event. 825 for a car that has been running 740s and 750s. That's quite a lady. Race drivers seem to have foxy wives for some reason. This is Lynette Shartman, if anybody cares. And here is Wally Booth. I guarantee you that if Wally Booth defeats yeah. Ronnie Sox with this independent, unsponsored Chevrolet, this place will be bedlam. Well, they both had some comparable times. Sox uh, to get to the finals at a 9.85 and Booth a 9.87. Ronnie Sox was either winner or runner-up of every major NHRA event in 1970. Look at the crowd beginning to come on to watch. Them. Even the horseback officers are trying to get to a vantage point where they can see this race. Wally Booth, the crowd is being pulled as to their favorites, and Booth out drew Sox three to one. But that's normal for the Chevrolet. They just seem to have more fans. Booth is staged. The biggest day in his drag racing career, the biggest moment. It's a green light start. Sox has an immediate advantage. The Chevrolet trying to catch it. He's not going to do it. No way. The king of pro stock. 986 for the Burlington, North Carolina team of Ronnie Sox and Buddy Martin. 141 miles per hour. <laughs> of course, a lot of the credit has to go to their mechanic, Jake King, and I'm sure Ronnie and Buddy will tell everyone that. The funny cars coming on uh, to the staging area and the uh, blue Hawaiian coming out first, I believe. And you were saying, Butch Maz, this is his first trip in this car? That is uh, first national competition? This is the first event in which he's competed with Roland Leong's Hawaiian. Butch was a top fuel driver, kind of an itinerant top fuel driver for a couple of years, one week in this car, one week in another car. Last year, he went on the road with Tom McEwen as a mechanic. And he worked so hard, and he did so well that Don Perdome gave him a chance to drive his top fuel dragster. Butch did at the Super Nationals and was the number one qualifier. Roland Leong took a look at that and decided that just might be the boy for my new Hawaiian, and it proved to be a wise choice. Looks like a happy wedding between the driver and the car. There were funny cars, and that's that. They've got the Ram Chargers fired up. The Ram Chargers are legendary for building more horsepower than anybody else. The big difference, and their big success has come from finally finding some reliability. They would always said low elapsed time, but the engines were like a grenade. The Hawaiians ready. Somebody once said that the Ram Chargers car is like a gun. They put a bullet in it, the bullet's the motor. They shoot it, they put another bullet in it. They've been known to bring a whole truckload of motors and you to use a motor every run. Incredible guys. Roland Leon could make it two in a row. He is the defending champion car owner. Roland did it here in 1966 when he won the Winter Nationals and came back the next year with a different driver and won it again. From the way they both burned out, they appear to be ready to go. Boy, are they ready. The tire, the burnouts are so hard that the tire smoke has even filled up the cockpit. Butch Moss may be having a little trouble seeing out of that car. Listen to that Ram Chargers motor. Just crisp and clean. Moss hanging in the back, trying to get those extra burn-ins. I would imagine that pretty soon Buster is gonna make him come to the starting line. That was probably what the owner of the car was talking to the starter about. He's got his man working a little extra hard on it. May very well be. May prove to be a wise move. A good strong burnout can be worth 15 hundredths of a second sometimes. And that just could be the difference, the way these two machines have performed. Both cars are pre-staged. Neither driver wants to stage first. Finally, Goldstein does. Moss moves in behind him, and it's a beautiful start. What a 
finish. The Hawaiian. Roland Leong makes it two in a row. The first big win ever for Butch Moss, the first time he drives the car. Boy, that is almost an Horatio Alger story. Low elapsed time of the event for funny cars, 6.93 seconds, 212 miles per hour. Here's the replay. You just can't make them any closer than that. Not hardly. One Not hardly. car length between them at 400 feet a second. Wins, that's something. The announcer right now is saying, ladies and gentlemen, Don Garlitz, and that's the only introduction he needs. The unique rear engine sensation. It would appear, Steve, that Garlitz will have a free run at Top Fuel Eliminator. What a shame. After the sensational racing we've had, Larry Bowers and Kenny Safford not able to make the call. And it must have really been serious because any top fuel owner in the pit area would have loaned them an engine and you can change them in about 45 minutes. So it must have been something they discovered at the last minute. So we're sorry to say we're gonna climax the Winter Nationals. And look at Garlitz, he's already shaking hands and he hasn't left the starting line. From Sefner, Florida. And I believe me, after this win and this new rear engine dragster, he's the undisputed king. And I think for the fans' sake, he smoked the tires on purpose. He did a little bit. He I put think on he quite did. a run for him. I don't know as how Safford could have caught him. That's not to demean Safford's car or the uh, equipment or his ability as a driver, but Garlitz as you indicated so many times throughout this telecast, appeared to be the class of the top fuel eliminators in contention here today, and his car probably was not really pressed at any time. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask you anyway. The future of the rear engine top fuel dragster. Well, I think it's here to stay. I believe that we'll see lots of cars built now because obviously the car is safer, the driver. I ran all day long, never got anything on my helmet or anything. It was just a nice, clean ride. The noise is not objectionable. You're not getting anything on your face. I believe we'll see a lot of cars. I, I believe this is the beginning of the end of the slingshot as we know it today. The rear engine dragster is certainly not a new idea, but it was never successful mainly due to handling problems, and you have absolutely none. That's right. You know, uh, you notice on the second day I got a little out of shape about halfway down when I ran in an oil slick and had no problem coming out of it, which was a good test. And then the smoking, the tires there on that run shows that the car handled very nicely even with the tires loose. So uh, I really don't know why they never have worked before. Uh, I think possibly it was a combination of tires and clutch. The things that we have today make it possible where they didn't have those a few years ago. Well, you are truly the big daddy after this.